We've got a lot to talk about, lots of sharp questions. So welcome to a new Q&A. My name is Shirvan and the questions that we will go over were submitted by the Patreon community. So without further ado, let's get started. Question number one by Contenders, who wants to know about the long-term geopolitical goals of Morocco. Most Moroccans reside by the temperate plains and hills, by the Mediterranean and Atlantic coastlines. Here the climate is suitable for agriculture, the demographic concentration also facilitates trade to and from Europe. And since antiquity, foreign powers from the Mediterranean as well as from the Atlantic have sought to occupy and exploit the Moroccan territories for its riches. Today the greatest geopolitical threat comes from neighboring Algeria. The governments in Rabat and Algiers are geopolitical rivals. Algeria in particular has been trying to influence and control Moroccan affairs by supporting the separatists in the Western Sahara region. This area happens to host valuable raw materials, so taken together the primary geopolitical goal of Morocco is to ensure its territorial integrity by regaining full control over the Western Sahara region. The secondary goal is to gain access to the European market without sacrificing its sovereignty. There are of course more objectives, such as contending with climate change, maintaining socio-economic stability and so on, but balancing between the economic and political needs between Europe and neighboring Algeria is the most imperative goal for Morocco. Second question by Javier, who wants to know how much is riding on the outcome of the Indian election. India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It has an enormous pool of tech-savvy, English-speaking employees, and this has created pockets of prosperity across the country. But that wealth hasn't been distributed equally. And it's difficult to resolve that economic disparity with the bureaucracy India has. Every year, a dozen million Indians enter the job market in search of employment. When Narendra Modi won the 2014 election, he promised economic prosperity, but some four years later the Prime Minister failed to deliver as is typical of populist leaders. In retrospect, economic growth in India has been quite impressive, but it just hasn't been enough. So to fire up voters for his re-election, Modi shifted his focus from economic development to national security. In 2014, Modi's party won enough seats to gain a majority, but still formed a coalition government. In the new election, if Modi's party fails to secure a majority, it will grant the coalition partners even greater leverage. In turn, this will make it even harder for the government to pass the already complicated economic reforms. The labor laws are especially daunting and emotionally charged but also pose as the most significant reform in the face of the increasing workplace automation. So essentially, Modi needs a clear majority win. Anything less will hamper and delay economic reforms and developments, and thereby eat away slowly at his credibility. Next question by Esten. How will the African geopolitical stage be affected by climate change in the coming future? And what preparations are, should, they take to prepare? And what consequences will it have for the rest of the world if African countries are not prepared to deal with such problems? This is actually quite an interesting question, one that deserves its own video. But according to the Climate Change Vulnerability Index, Africa is being hit hardest by climate change. Seven of the ten countries most at risk are in Africa. Climate change is affecting the continent in a number of ways. Foremost, weather patterns are changing drastically and resulting in more serious environmental disasters such as droughts and floods. Water stress levels are another prevailing issue. In some parts of the continent, rivers and lakes are receding, while in other parts, glaciers are melting and changing the flow of rivers. This actually impacts the 
local hydroelectric dams and transportation systems, etc. So you can imagine what kind of impact this has on the livelihoods of the people. For instance, in East Africa, rainfall has diminished significantly and for a region that depends almost entirely on rain for its agriculture, that is a drastic change. The result has been poor crop yields and livestock productivity, ultimately leading to famine and humanitarian disasters. In Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, about 12 million people are facing malnourishment, and as the distribution of water changes, it affects the local settlements. Severe flooding has destroyed towns across Africa, and as resources get stretched thinly due to climate change and population growth, disputes over fertile land and clean water have intensified and led to more violence. The UN predicts that in the next 25 years, access to water will be the single biggest cause of conflict in Africa. And in turn, this contributes and will continue to contribute to the migration of people. Next question by Divash. What can a small, powerless, landlocked country like Nepal do to maintain its sovereignty and control its destiny? Compulsions must be weighed against constraints. Self-determination for small, landlocked countries like Nepal is tricky. They have less options and tools to create their own policies. Depending on the environment, some landlocked nations seek to maximize their positions by playing regional or global powers against one another in hopes of extracting additional concessions. This is a dangerous policy though, it requires constant vigilance because it can backfire tremendously. Nepal's situation is complicated by its dependency on Indian ports and growing Chinese influence by the Tibetan border. That is a vulnerability as well as a strength. Situated along the Tibetan plateau, Nepal serves as a launch pad from and to Tibet, which could grant either Beijing or New Delhi greater strategic leverage in the periphery. Nepalese policymakers can use that and have been using that to gain greater autonomy in its policymaking. But you don't want to push either side too hard. A clear balance must be maintained. Nobody ever claimed geopolitics is fair. Next question by Patrick, who wants to know about the future of Russia after Putin and what kind of impact that has on the regional nations, as well as Putin's recent economic reforms. When Putin came to power, he worked out a social contract with the Russian public to maintain economic stability, a policy known as Putinomics. We actually did a video on this quite some time ago, I'll post a link for those who want to watch it again in the description. But in the last few years, the Kremlin has been forced to make increasingly unpopular decisions that eat away at the foundation of Putinomics. All sorts of taxes are increasing, as has the retirement age. Since then, Putin's approval ratings have fallen to its lowest point in 13 years. Only a third of the Russian public trusts the president, despite the enormous resources employed to polish the image of Putin. Now, such polls must always be taken with a grain of salt, but it does indicate a deep-running discontent due to the social economic problems that the country is enduring. Since past election, Russians have been increasingly talking about the future of their country without Putin. In this context, it is noteworthy to point out that since the steady decline of Putin's approval ratings, a string of Russian officials, handpicked by Putin himself, have been promoted as governors and ministers. In a way, this can be seen as Putin's way of tutoring a successor. Some of the notable figures include Economic Development Minister Maxim, Presidential Chief of Staff Anton, and Agricultural Bank CEO Dmitry. All three happen to be in their 30s and 40s. In the coming years, Putin is likely to test these up-and-coming politicians by pitting them against each other. But regardless of who comes to power, or should I say who inherits the office of the presidency, a post-Putin Russia will face severe domestic and international issues. 
nations in the proximity, like Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus, will try to pull away from Russia. Meanwhile, global powers will try to fill the vacuum of power. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Next question by Diegon, who wants to know about Ukraine's presidential elections and what the possible consequences are for Ukraine. Zelensky's populist appeal comes from the fact that Ukraine's public is quite bitter with the country's political establishment. Now, obviously that's not a phenomenon that is restricted to Ukraine, but in a world where clowns are elected to office, at least Ukrainians elected a professional. But jokes aside, during his campaign, Zelensky didn't reveal much of substance about his policies. When he did speak of politics, he promised to fight corruption and resolve the conflict with Russia. So corruption and Russia will be the focus of Zelensky. And in both fields, Zelensky will face the same constraints that the previous president faced. The Russians have been stockpiling troops along the fragile border of eastern Ukraine, as well as by the Sea of Azov, and Putin is likely to force the hand of Zelensky as a means of testing his resolve and policy. This is likely to happen sooner than later, as for corruption, that may actually prove even more difficult and more challenging than the Russian conflict. The entire architecture of the Ukrainian government was designed in the 1990s by the powerful oligarchy, so there are a lot of conspicuous dealings embedded in the state, and all this hinders meaningful reforms. To combat corruption, Zelensky will have to make some tough calls that will upset a large portion of his followers. He will have to push for judicial, legal taxes and security reforms to weed out the interests of the oligarchy. Even then, the reforms will remain dubious. For instance, when former President Poroshenko promised to curb corruption, he was in fact transferring power from the other oligarchs to his own hands. This made Poroshenko a lot of powerful enemies. Among them was an oligarch who owned the TV channel that aired Zelensky's comedy special. So despite Zelensky's claims to be a regular Joe, he is in truth a millionaire working for billionaires. How sincere his anti-corruption program is will ultimately depend on its actions. Next question by Martin. What are the most influential geopolitical positions of the Indochina countries? Now, I'm not 100% sure what is meant here, but if you're referring to the geopolitical character of Indochina or Southeast Asia, then secessionist tendencies come to mind. Most of the central governments in the region do not have full control over their territories, especially not over the remote geographical areas. And this creates a lot of misconceptions as to the true extent of the Southeast Asian states. For instance, looking at the statistics and the map of Indonesia, we can see a regional power in the making. But when we consider the history and the insurgent attitudes in the islands and regions beyond Jaffa, we can see Indonesia for what it really is, a federalized and decentralized state where the government has trouble enforcing a coherent policy. Now, if the question concerns the most important position, then look no further than the Malacca Strait. This is one of the world's busiest waterways. It handles about a fifth of global trade, and one third of the world's crude oil shipments pass here. And that market share will grow in the coming decades as the regional economies mature. For the moment, the economies of China, South Korea, Japan rely on open access to the Malacca Strait for their economic and thereby social stability. Any power that wants to impose its will on East Asia or Southeast Asia needs a navy formidable enough to patrol the seas adjacent to the Malacca Strait. So that is a lot of power vested in one small area. The next question by Matthew. Any thoughts on the petroleum discoveries offshore of Pakistan? Pakistan has an enormous appetite for energy, but only 15% of its petroleum needs are met by domestic production. That is dangerously low. 
the rest is imported from sources far beyond its borders. However, high energy prices have inflated import bills and drained Islamabad's foreign exchange reserves. So Pakistan may have hit the jackpot with the recent discovery. According to early studies, the hydrocarbon deposits may be enough for Pakistan's needs for the next three decades. That will fundamentally reinforce the country's energy security and give the state more options going into the future. But the discovery of crude oil may also be a blessing in disguise, especially in the case of Pakistan. The country is burdened by socio-economic problems. Its literacy rate stands at 58%, school enrollment stands at 76%, while some 21 million Pakistanis do not have access to clean water. On top of that, corruption is deeply embedded in the state, and only 1% of Pakistanis actually pays its taxes. For those reasons and many more, the authority of the civilian government is weak. So the country needs drastic and systematic reforms, and despair can be a good motivator. Imran Khan and his party acknowledge the social economic troubles and have taken serious steps towards reform. However, the discovery of oil would reduce pressure for reform and allow the state to postpone the necessary changes indefinitely, leaving the country a victim of the resource curse. So a serious plan is necessary and educational reforms must be pushed through regardless of the discovery of oil and the relaxed urgency of the situation. Next question by Martijn. Which geopolitical powers can we expect to try get influence in the power gap in Sudan after Bashir? The Republic of the Sudan is a tough country to crack, one that is often overlooked in the mainstream outlets, but Sudanese geopolitics is quite fascinating. As a nation with access to the Red Sea and located at the convergence of the White and Blue Nile rivers, Sudan plays a pivotal role in the regional power distribution. Iran, Turkey and Saudi Arabia are fiercely invested in securing access to Sudan's valuable assets. Iran wants to create a new smuggling route to supply Hezbollah as well as to pressure the Saudis from across the Red Sea. In the 1990s, a deal was reached between Sudan and Iran, allowing the latter to construct military bases. In recent years, however, those assets have dwindled. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia, always looking to counter Iran, sees an opening as Iran's influence diminishes. Now, Riyadh seeks to oust the Iranians from Sudan completely by offering financial aid. As for Turkey, it's playing the long game. Ankara wants to gain control over the White and Blue Nile rivers, allowing the Turks to pressure their Egyptian counterparts from the rear. Plus, Turkey is constructing a port in Sudan which will function as a trading hub as well as a means to counter Egypt's Suez Canal. For these three powers, the fall of Bashir means it's open season in Sudan. Next question by Eric. Is Taiwan Chinese reunification inevitable? And if so, under what time frame? Or have the two drifted too far apart over the decades? This is a really interesting question, one that actually deserves its own video. But basically, China has negotiated for reunification with Taiwan by all means. Sometimes offering economic deals, economic sweeteners, and sometimes making military threats. So this has been a carrot and stick policy. But this has lasted for so long that the new generation of Taiwanese do not see their future with China. The youth is fiercely independent-minded, which in turn restrains the options of the state. At the same time, Beijing has self-imposed a deadline for reunification by 2049, which would mark the 100th anniversary of the foundation of the People's Republic of China. As such, Chinese policymakers are feeling an urgency to end the separation ahead of schedule. 
The result is a tense relationship between China and Taiwan, but as long as Taiwan refrains from declaring independence, Beijing is unlikely to take military action. Another important factor is the changing geopolitical environment. As relations between Washington and Beijing worsen, Taiwan is set to become an important tool in the regional power balance. In December 2017, President Trump indicated that the United States was not bound to the One China policy, which signals that the Americans are weighing in their options to use Taiwan as a means to pressure China. And all these factors discourage reunification. Ultimately, no major change is likely to occur before 2030. By then, the modernization of the Chinese military will have largely be completed, which would grant Beijing significantly more leverage. Thus, from 2030 onwards, the situation will get desperate and we will start to see some changes then. And with that, we come to the end of our Q&A. Thank you so much for these wonderful and interesting questions. We are fully funded by our audience, so if you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon community. For now, thank you for watching and sagol.